Now let's talk about structural lipids. So these are the lipids that can be used for energy also, but mostly act as components of the uh, either the cell membrane or membranes of cellular organelles. And uh, you can classify them different ways. Um, so the, the phospholipids, for example, are just lipids that have um, uh, two uh, alkyl chains connected one way or the other, uh, and then uh, a phosphate group that forms part of the head group. Um, and then glycolipids are, uh, again, just lipids with two or more uh, uh, long chains with a sugar molecule of some sort uh, that uh, forms part of the head group. And then there are a special class of uh, uh, what are called ether lipids, which have actually polar groups at both ends that are attached by ether uh, linkages, which we'll talk about. So uh, first of all, the, the phospholipids are probably the most um, uh, important ones, especially for uh, eukaryotes. So again, a phospholipid has two fatty acid chains connected by a glycerol group. So uh, structurally, they're, they're very similar to the triacylglycerols, except for um, one of the uh, carbons on the glycerol group has, instead of another fatty acid, has, uh, in this case, a phosphate group, which then is a connection point for some sort of polar head group um, constituent. So, um, uh, for example, these are different um, glycerophospholipids that have different groups on them. So, uh, if the if the phosphate just has a hydrogen, in other words, there is no uh, extra su substitute there, then uh, it's just phosphatidic acid. Um, phosphatidylethanolamine would be, uh, if you add this ethanolamine group, choline uh, is this molecule or this group here, um, uh, nitrogen with four uh, carbon groups attached to it. Um, and then uh, phosphatidylserine is just a serine amino acid uh, linked to that glycerol. And then the, uh, these are all, if you have another glycerol added, then it's just phosphatidylglycerol and so on. Uh, this one here, phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate, um, is important. This is an inositol group uh, here, and so that's an important signaling molecule, which we'll talk about later. Uh, phosphatidylcholine is particularly is important because this is a major component of the membrane of eukaryotic cells. So a galactolipid is another example of an important structural lipid for plants. Um, this is a, a glycolipid, so these are uh, uh, lipids where the polar head group in this case is a galactose or a galactobiose, so two galactose, uh, galactose disaccharides um, attached to the glycerol group. And these are important, uh, for, are found in chloroplast membranes, for example. Um, actually, the the availability of phosphates uh, for plants because uh, it's not as easily available from from soil um, as it is for animals uh, is probably why they uh, use these these uh, galactolipids or glycolipids more than the phospholipids um, and then sphingolipids are uh, have similar properties to uh, the phospholipids uh, except for one of the fatty acid chains in a sphingolipid is this sphingosine group here. So a sphingosine is just a long uh, carbon chain uh, with this amino alcohol group at the end and that's what links it to the fatty acid and to its um, its head group. So it's just a, a, modif a different version uh, of uh, from the phospholipid. Again you can put lots of different things at that head group um, so if there's no uh, nothing but a hydrogen there, uh, then this molecule is called a ceramide. And so that's sort of the, the base uh, basis of a, uh, of a sphingolipid. Um, and then uh, a phosphocholine group, which is the same phosphocholine that you would find in a phosphatidylcholine uh, lipid, uh, that added on forms something called sphingomyelin. So uh, sphingomyelin um, is an important, uh, we'll talk about more in a second. Um, a glucose molecule or sugar molecule um, uh, is a glucosal cerebroside, um, and then uh, there are other uh, more complex 
sugars you can add there too. And so again, you can form lots of different molecules by adding different uh, substituents of that head group. Um, again, sphingomyelin is an important uh, lipid. It's structurally very similar to phosphatidylcholine um, because it's got that same phosphocholine head group. Um, but sphingomyelin, uh, I mean sphingolipids, this particular sphingolipid, in fact, is found in uh, specialized membranes, so uh, membranes that have special functional properties. Um, so, for example, in animals, sphingomyelin is found in... Um, um, myelin cells. These are the cells that, that sort of insulate axons in the nervous system. Uh, another interesting example of sphingolipids are the molecules that determine the ABO blood group. So um, if you know your blood type, um, you're either O or A or B or AB. Those are the four different uh, blood groups within the ABO, or blood types within the ABO blood group. Um, and that which blood type you are is determined by which of these three different uh, uh, sphingolipids are found in uh, your your body. So um, the uh, each one they're all three very similar to each other, but each each version has a slightly different sugar molecule. So um, the the uh, it's a polysaccharide that's attached to the sphingomyelin or sphingolipid and uh, the the A antigen has an uh, N acetyl glucosamine residue at this position whereas the B antigen has a galactose residue at this position and the O antigen doesn't have um, either so uh, the enzyme that produces this uh, particular sphingolipid uh, can make one of these three uh, versions. Actually, the enzyme makes either the A or the B version, depending on which version of the enzyme you have. And if you have a non-functional enzyme, uh, then you form the O antigen. So that's why O blood type is recessive. So if you don't have any functional copy of the enzyme, then you will produce the O antigen and you'll have the O blood type. Whereas if you're, uh, if you have the enzyme that produces the A, or the version of the enzyme that produces the A antigen, then you'll have an A blood type um, even if you only have one functional copy. And the version that produces the B antigen will, will give you the B blood type, and you can have both. You could have uh, one copy of the enzyme that produces the A antigen from one parent and a copy that produces the B antigen from your other parent, and therefore you'd have the AB blood type. So that's just an example of, of how uh, sphingolipids uh, function there. In this case, they're just sort of... Um, uh, cell surface molecules that are important for binding other proteins but it also happens to just determine the blood type which is important because the cells of your immune system that that are able to tell the difference between your cells versus uh, someone else's cells look for those antigens so if your blood contains uh, the the this version for example the a version of this um, uh, antigen and you got let's say a blood transfusion or an organ transplant from someone who had the B antigen then your immune system would recognize that as foreign and it would attack it and so that's why matching blood types for people who receive donations of blood or tissue is important um, meanwhile if you are blood type O that means that you lack either the A or the B antigen you can't receive blood from someone who has either antigen However, if you are blood type O, you can donate blood to uh, someone who is either blood type A or B because um, it will it will not be recognized as foreign because they uh, you lack either of those antigens. And then, of course, it's important to remember that all of these structural lipids um, form the the membrane as this bilayer structure. So, uh, the, the lipid bilayer of all cell membranes and all organelle membranes consists of two layers of these lipids, phospholipids and sphingolipids, um, uh, arranged this way. So that the polar head group, whatever they're made of, so whether it's phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylethanolamine or whatever, uh, the polar group is facing out, and the the nonpolar groups, uh, the tails, are are on the inside of the bilayer. So uh, there are two leaves essentially uh, to the bilayer, and the uh, w the inner portions are are uh, free of water, and the outer portions are free to uh, come in contact with water. And so again, this is what what forms the cell membrane. It's what keeps the inside of the cell separate from the outside. Um, anything 
with a polar charge, I mean with a, a polar nature to it or an, or an ionic charge, cannot cross the membrane uh, on its own. But any protein or uh, other kind of molecule that is um, structurally similar to um, uh, or has a, a nonpolar group to it um, can uh, embed itself in the membrane uh, and will. And so that's why a lot of membrane proteins have have nonpolar domains or their their transmembrane domains are generally nonpolar. Um, and then there are uh, proteins that uh, perhaps are do not have nonpolar domains, but they can be linked to uh, to lipids or to uh, sugar molecules, and that's how they're attached to the membrane. Uh, anything that wants to go through the membrane um, that's that's polar or charged has to go through a channel. So proteins uh, in the membrane that have uh, the ability to act as channels also have to have some nonpolar domain that allows them to to sort of stay in the membrane. Um, and then, of course, it's also uh, worth mentioning that the lipids uh, that make up the bilayer are not attached to each other. So there's no covalent linkage between any of these molecules. They're, they're just held together by hydrophobic interactions and polar interactions uh, with water. Um, so they're all free to, to move around within the bilayer, as are all of these proteins and other molecules that are embedded in the membrane unless they are anchored to something else so if they're anchored to the extracellular matrix or they're anchored to the um, proteins of the cytoskeleton inside the cell then they'll stay in place um, but otherwise they can sort of float around inside the membrane um, so that's that's just the way that the uh, lipid bilayer works and then one other uh, kind of weird example of a structural lipid are these uh, ether lipids. So these are uh, only only really make up the the a major component of the membrane of archaea. So archaea, remember, are uh, a type of prokaryote that are actually distantly related or more closely related to eukaryotes than bacteria are, but they're a separate group from bacteria, and they have these sort of double-headed uh, lipids where you have two long uh, uh, alkyl chains called uh, diphytanil groups that are linked at either end by a pair of glycerols so it forms actually like a big giant ring and then uh, the glycerols also contain some sort of uh, uh, polar group so at one end you have a glycerol phosphate at the other end you have uh, uh, some sugar molecules attached. So uh, they're polar at both ends and kind of non-polar in the middle. So uh, with archaea, they have they have cell membranes that can be made of these um, these uh, molecules, and they're called ether lipids because the uh, the alkyl groups are connected to the glycerol by an ether linkage. But uh, this sort of uh, having polar ends at both uh, polar groups at both ends means you can essentially form a lipid monolayer. So in the case of again bacteria and, and eukaryotes, the cell membrane is made up of a, of a lipid bilayer. But in archaea, uh, because they have these double-headed lipids, they can form a lipid monolayer. So you would just have instead of two molecules, two sets of molecules in each leaf, you would just have uh, these small these amphipathic molecules that uh, extend from one side of the, the membrane to another so it's just a different way of, of organizing the cell membrane uh, and then one other uh, type of lipid which is not itself a structural component of the membrane but does affect the structure of the membrane are uh, called sterols so so again most lipids are uh, long unbranched uh, have unbranched change but sterols have this structure where uh, there's a polar head group, which is, which is a, an alcohol group, but then a long uh, chain of carbons that form several different ring structures. And so it's, it's still a big long, uh, uh, and it's called a steroid nucleus. Um, and uh, so cholesterol 
is an example of a sterol and cholesterol is found in the membrane of some cells and is important for affecting the fluidity and permeability of the membrane. So like I said, within the, the lipid bilayer, these molecules can more or less freely float around and so can the proteins embedded in it. Um, but one thing that affects the fluidity and how easily things can, can move around in the membrane is the concentration of cholesterol. So that's one of the functions of cholesterol. So uh, next time we will talk about some of the other things that lipids are involved in.